ich möchte Carolina und Ralf für die Einladung danken, äh, als, äh, mich als Redner äh, dabei zu haben. I am going to speak today in English. I would beg your forgiveness, but if I continued in my schrecklich Deutsch, you would beg me to stop. So thank you uh, for letting me talk today. Um, I'm going to speak about wagging the long tail of digital preservation. I don't know what this idiom is in English or in German, but wagging a tail is what a dog does. And the long tail is a particular concept from new media that I'm going to be bringing into the concept uh, into the realm of digital preservation. I'm going to be drawing for inspiration on a book that I just published with a guy named Rick Reinhardt of Berkeley. Uh, it's called Recollection Art, New Media and Social Memory. Uh, Kunst, Medien, Neuen Medien und Gedächtnis Sozial, something like that. Um, and um, it just came out in July, but it raises uh, um, a kind of warning to those of us who deal with digital media or will deal with digits uh, in every field of study that I'm aware of, things are turning digital very quickly. And um, this book takes as a premise that if we keep doing the things that we have been doing to safeguard culture, culture will disappear, at least the culture of the 21st century that we find so exciting, those of us who study the way the internet works, the way computers work, the way our new social media work. So I'm going to continue with that drastic, dramatic sort of departure from the ways that we have done things in the past in today's keynote, and uh, hopefully um, make uh, suggestions for how we can work with this dire problem. Um, Ralph alluded to the digital curation program at the University of Maine where we tried to actually make this happen. We tried to train students in ways to, um, uh, to adapt new strategies uh, to help our culture survive the impending obsolescence and oblivion of digital media. Uh, but I know that uh, there are other people who are here in Karlsruhe and elsewhere in Europe who are active in similar fronts. You'll be hearing from Dragan later today, and um, I'm hoping that uh, some of what uh, I speak of can rub off on you, as we say, and some of what you are doing can rub off on me. So let's talk first about the way that archives and librarians are set up now. This is the way they pretty much looked from the 1700s until the 1900s, like the 20th century. We think of a library as shelves and stacks, and we think of a, a museum as a warehouse of paintings on racks. This is what they increasingly look like in the 21st century. I don't know if you can see or if we need to close the uh, blinds, but um, warehouses of computers. Uh, I know that, for example, at ZKM down the road, um, some of my colleagues we're describing the way that you know there are racks and racks of old uh, hard drives and computer cases and the monitors that are hard to find anymore. And this is what we have become, whether you're a museum, an archive, a library, but also increasingly government offices and photography studios and anywhere where everything is turning digital, in order to access older media, we need stockpiles of ancient computers. The problem, of course, is that these shells will gradually decay so that uh, either the hardware uh, dies or the software dies, leaving us with something like this, a kind of graveyard of ancient computing technology. Um, we might think, well, you know, uh, this is something that uh, uh, certainly the, the, the biggest organizations in the world, you know, the, um, you know, someone at Caite uh, or the Library of Congress in the United States or, or someone will figure this out and then we will have a computer that will work forever. Well, I was recently in a conference in 2013, last year, uh, sponsored by the Library of Congress and this was their conclusion. We cannot all become museums of computer hardware. It's very hard to become a museum of computer hardware. Why? Well, we're used to storing things in the crate, right? This is how we save the Mona Lisa. This is how we save uh, precious uh, uh, photographs and parchment uh, from the Middle Ages. But we can't do that with digital technologies. If you put things in a crate, over time, you take them out 10, 20, 30 years later. What has happened? Oh, there's no more floppy drive. Oh, the electrical uh, pin doesn't work anymore. Oh, the CD has delaminated. The tapes have demagnetized. The web links are gone. They're 404. They're not found. This is what happens when you put something digital in a crate. So storage is death. And crates start to look more like mausoleums the longer you take to open them. 
So if storage, which is the default method for preserving culture up until the, 20, the 19th century, will no longer work, or it's to the 20th century, will no longer work for the 21st, what can we do? How can we find the answer? Where does that answer lie? If it's not about keeping something fixed, if it's not about making the original safe for future generations, what other strategy, what other inspiration can we look to? And one of the ways I've been thinking about this is the idea of the phoenix. I don't know how you say this in German. Phoenix, okay, good. Um, so the phoenix, of course, is a legendary bird from ancient Greece, which uh, lived for hundreds of years by itself anyway, 600 years, depending on the legend you hear. And then it died, but it was reborn in this fire of its death to become a new phoenix risen from the ashes of the old phoenix. So this is not storage. <laughs> It is not an egg that stays forever. This is a bird that recreates itself, that is reborn in a new form every 100 years or so. Well, we need digital culture to be reborn every few years. If you press a CD, you think, oh, I have, this, I have it safe. It's on my shelf in a CD. Studies suggest, actually out of uh, IBM in Deutschland, that uh, CDs that you press yourself last about five years. Five years, that's nothing, right, for cultural history. And that's the form that we are thinking about in terms of preserving culture. Well, then we need a phoenix that can keep, like, you know, every five or 10 or, or 15 years recreating itself. So where would we find this phoenix? How would we uh, look to examples where this is already happening in culture? I don't think we'll find them in museums, not generally, not in archives, not in libraries. We need to look far outside of the institution's walls at least at this point. In fact, I think we need to look very far away. I suggest we look in Brazil, in the rainforest of Brazil, in the Amazon, where native Indians of South America have kept alive the story of a creature that they call the Mapinguere. The Mapinguere made such an impression on the Indians of this area that almost everyone has a name for this creature, and they have a sort of uh, legend that survives in the stories that are told. It's a giant monster, basically. Uh, it's 20 feet tall, like, um, you know, four meters, five meters tall, uh, covered with a bony carapace. You could shoot an arrow at it and it will bounce right off. It can move quietly through the jungle without being seen, and it, uh, it has these uh, amazing sort of attributes that are told and retold in stories uh, and, uh, handed down uh, from one generation to another in these tribes in the Amazon. Now, I might, you might ask my, me, well, okay, that's fine, stories about this creature, but um, why is this important for cultural heritage when we're talking about real things? You know, the Declaration of Independence, the Magna Carta, uh, a, a famous work of video art. These are things that are real. They are not like some crazy uh, story about a legendary creature. Well, I might ask, which is the oldest human record? If I think in terms of, no, uh, it's not about what, whether this thing exists right now and you can go see it. It's about, is it a, a memory, a human memory? Um, that we can record. And we think of things like the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Judea Cylinders or Rosetta Stone. Well, Rosetta Stone is only from uh, 200 BCE, so it's, it's not that old. It's like 2,000 years old. It seems old. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, a little longer. The 400 BCE is the oldest one, supposedly. The Judea Cylinders, those are quite old. That's about 2,000 BCE or 4,000 years from present past into the past. The Mapinguere story? tens of thousands of years old, at least 20,000, possibly more. Well, how do I know? I can't just go up to some natives in the Amazon and say, hey, how old is the story? They say, oh, I learned it from my dad. Well, here, where did he learn it? Oh, he learned it from his grandmother. They're not gonna remember back. But fortunately, there was a case of an ethnobiologist, um, Glenn Shepard, who was studying the story of the Mapinguere, who went to the Amazon and said, um, you know, I really am interested to know more about this creature. And one of the, the natives said, oh, there's one in Peru. We said, oh, th this creature still exists? Oh, no, it's in a museum. It's in, it's in a museum in Peru of natural history. There's a diorama, and they have a model of it. And so he went to Peru and he said, ah, do we have this model? And he looked around, he looked around, he finally found the picture. 
And it was a diorama of prehistoric creatures. The Mapinguri, reasoned Glenn Shepard, is the Megatherium, a beast that roamed the, uh, the uh, Americas, the South American continent, over 20,000 years ago. So this is a story that has been passed on from generation to generation for tens of thousands of years about a beast that died out and is now extinct. And it lives only because it is retold. The story of the Mapinguri is reperformed, passed on from generation to generation in a way that leaves no stored artifact. There is no painting, no sculpture, no text. This is simply a kind of re-performance, a re-performance of the object. So this, I think, is as close as I have seen to the phoenix, something that can be reborn. All right, well, what, what does this have to do with museums, right? Um, there's a Guggenheim, I used to work there. Um, and you think about, okay, if I'm not going to store art, if I know that putting a computer in a crate is eventually going to make it die, what alternative do I have? Well, we were very interested in looking at models for preserving a work that re-performs it. And in particular, we looked at something called emulation. Emulation you'll see in more detail when um, Dragan, I think, speaks about it. Uh, but for now, I'll just mention a show in 2004 uh, created called Seeing Double, where we put an original piece with the old equipment still running, barely, you know, and next to it, an emulated version. To emulate means to imitate the look and feel of something without the same medium. So its guts have changed, but on the outside, the experience, the behavior of it is, is similar, or ideally identical. Um, and we did this test to see what would happen if you could emulate a work. So here's one of our kind of centerpieces of the exhibition. The Earl King, uh, a work originally from 1982, one of the first interactive video pieces in the world by Graham Weidman and Roberta Friedman. This piece was on its last legs when we found it. Uh, this is the original version. It had an ancient Sony computer from 1980. It had a bunch of black boxes, analog laser discs. Those were those great big things before we had DVDs, and there wasn't even the digital version. It was analog. Um, Graham managed to find a couple of them on, on eBay that were still working. So it's, it's barely alive. It's like a patient on life support, you know, in the hospital, beeping. Bing, ping, bing, ping, ping, just waiting for it to flatline. So what we did is we worked with the artist and we took the original code that ran on this computer and emulated it on a more up-to-date uh, Linux box with a single hard drive that had all the videos on it. So the guts are completely different, but the code is the same. The idea is if it has a sort of spirit or a behavior that you can somehow keep, the digits, the ones and zeros, might be that spirit. So an emulator in computer terms is a program that fools old code into thinking it's running on the old computer. But in fact, it's running in a new computer that is impersonating the old one. So basically, we put these two in a gallery and we said, what do you think? We asked the general public, put out a survey. And how do you feel about these two versions? And they said, I don't know why you put two of the same thing in your gallery. We said, we said ah, they don't realize the guts are different. So we cut out a hole and put plexiglass in front so that they could see the different apparatus used to make the two pieces. Say, so, oh, I get it now. OK, these are old things. I see 104 cables and this ancient computer with a floppy drive. Doesn't even have a hard drive. And oh, OK, and over here, yes, this is new. And that, uh, we did a survey, and they suggested, yes, ah, OK, this seems to be working. This is, this is a, a successful way to recreate culture. And even the Library of Congress said, ah, OK, emulation, that's serving our needs better than hardware. So they were along for the ride. Great. So we have an example of a phoenix coming from inside the museum. Just one problem, one interesting note. This emulation by professionals, I'm going to start in 2004 because that's when I got involved in it, and that was the first museum exhibition I know that was really based on emulation. And of course, it's running up to the present time. Emulation by amateurs has been going on since at least 1974. So that's 30 years, 30 years that the museums have been twiddling their thumbs thinking, 
Ooh, maybe we should do about this. No, let's not do something about this. Oh, maybe storage will be fine. Yeah, let's, let's not worry about storage. And it's, oh, okay, maybe we should do something. And meanwhile, these amateurs, people who are not professionals, they don't work in museums, they don't work in archives, they have been producing emulators to play games, right? So we have Graham Weinbrenn, Earl King, Nintendo, Super Mario, right? And the Super Mario has survived very, very well because of people creating these programs who are outside of institutions. Well, this is strange. Uh, we're not used to, as professionals, looking to amateurs, you know, aficionados, uh, people who are, are not uh, um, paid to do the work of cultural preservation. We're not looking to them for leadership. I think we should. Why? Because this is how they do it. This is the original um, N Nintendo system, the lifespan that it had. This is the amount of time that they worked on this, um, this uh, uh, one of the most recent uh, emulators, FCE, it's called. It, it, uh, it uh, emulates the original um, hardware that ran all those Nintendo games that your, your cousin or, your, or you, you played when you were a little kid, Donkey Kong and Mario Kart and all that. Um, but it was created in a fascinating way. Um, someone threw out an emulator uh, that was dirty code, as he put it. He said, this is terrible, but maybe you guys can do something with it. Right? And that was around 2000. Um, it was open source and only had one platform, DOS. Uh, and then other people said, oh, I can, I can fix this a little bit. And they worked on something, changed FCE Ultra. And then other people said, oh, I should add this thing. Oh, no, I want to put this other thing. And it, as we say, forked, it proliferated into many different versions, each of which offered its own new feature. And then in the end, uh, a team of people, again, these are not professionals. They're not even in the same room. They're teenagers with acne in their mother's basements working around the globe because they all want to play Mario Kart again, or Super Mario, or whatever. And they get together and they, they create this emulator in the end that has all of these features. It was open source at the beginning, so it was easy for people to modify, and now it has incredible number of platforms and map making and scripting and all kinds of things that you can do with it. So it's a tremendously powerful emulator. And there are hundreds of these emulators. This is not the only one. If you go to Wikipedia under, under uh, Nintendo alone, you'll see a dozen for Windows, at least. So people have been producing these for decades without the museum world noticing at all. They've been completely oblivious to the idea of, of, of emulation. If you talk to someone 10 years ago about emulation in the museum world, they, they think you're talking about nuclear fusion. Like, no, I, I, I can't possibly do that. That's way too complicated. But these kids in their bedrooms are doing this. So can we learn from this? Can we figure out what are they doing right that museums are doing wrong? Because they're winning the race. They've kept game culture alive while our precious artifacts of the 20th century and 21st century are turning to dust or inert assemblages of plastic and wire in our beautiful climate-controlled vaults. What are they doing right that we're not? Well, we pick things that are sublime, like, ah, we have this you know, great, important work of video art. They're unique. We make an emulator of it. Well, guess what? <laughs> At the Guggenheim, we only made one emulator, and it only runs this one platform that nobody else uses except for Graham Weinbrenn and Roberta Friedman. So it, for all intents and purposes, we made one copy of one thing. It was also authorized. We worked with the artist. It was very important that we felt, OK, we have an artist who agrees to do this. Um, we, we found technicians. It was sort of a perfect storm. We had funding. We had, we had a museum that was going to do a show. We had uh, the artist and access to the original equipment, brilliant technicians, and so forth. But that's not the way the emulators that are built by gamers work. Instead of sublime, they are base. They are low. You know, this is lofty, this is lowly. We're talking about pop culture, you know, Super Mario. Who cares whether Super Mario survives? Well, these gamers do. What else? Instead of unique, it's proliferative. They made lots of them. They opened the source. Anyone can do this, right? Go ahead, make your own version of the emulator. We don't care. Maybe we'll put it back into ours later. It was a very different model from this sort of like controlling the intellectual property of a piece and making sure that we you know, examine its authenticity as we, as we produce a new version or as we restore the old version. No, it's just, OK, go at it, do your best, and may the best you know, emulators win. And finally, it was definitely not authorized, but it was underground. Uh, in fact, um, these emulators, there's no one in charge. There's no copyright holder. There's no funder. There's no vendor. There is no one to help them. It's just a, a, a sort of dispersed band of programmers working on this project in a completely amateur way. 
In fact, um, as if the technical details weren't enough to threaten them, uh, this is from the Nintendo website, which you can go look up. The introduction of emulators represents the greatest threat to date to the intellectual property rights of video game developers. This is Nintendo saying, don't do this. This is terrible, right? So not only are they slaving away without money or, or you know, institutional support, they're actually being sued or under threat of, of, of legal action from the very companies whose work they are trying to preserve for the future. Is Nintendo doing something to preserve their games for the future? Why would they? They get better by having them go obsolete and, and have you spend more on the new platforms, right? So these, these sort of unacknowledged amateurs are doing the heavy lifting of digital preservation today. All right, so maybe we need to rethink this metaphor because sublime, authorized, unique, that's the phoenix. Base, underground, proliferative, that's a salamander very different creature than the phoenix, right? Um, they crawl underground, they're lowly, you know, they, they, they proliferate a lot, as you, anyone who saw the news of the lizards in the um, International Space Station uh, will learn. Um, well, okay, what about the whole point that it's supposed to kind of regenerate itself and be able to be reborn in fire like the phoenix? Well, it turns out there's this legendary creature of the salamander that was supposed to be able to survive fire. In fact, in medieval times, it was known as this creature that would crawl out from under logs when there was a fire. And so people said, oh, it actually lives in the fire. That's a, the salamander is this thing that, that, that actually, like, it, you know, is this beast that survives on fire. Um, this guy named Leonardo da Vinci, maybe you've heard of him, said the salamander gets no food but from the fire, in which it constantly renews its scaly skin. So it turns out the salamander is also a kind of spirit of regenerative preservation, albeit a lowly rather than lofty one like the phoenix. Um, and I think this is a particularly apt metaphor for both uh, the, the two examples I gave so far, the Mapinguere story and emulators, because uh, in the case of the Mapinguere, the culture of South America was constantly under fire uh, upon the arrival of the conquistadors, right? So uh, they would burn temples, they would destroy artifacts that could be made you know, of wood or some other uh, element uh, that was sturdy. Um, and so the only things that survived were those oral re-performed stories and dances and songs. Um, even masks survived because mask carving was considered a process. The mask itself was not important. And so it was the process of carving a mask that was passed on. So the mask could be burned or buried or thrown into the sea by the Spaniards, but the, uh, the, 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 the process, the, the behavior of carving masks survived. Uh, and this reminds me a little bit of the, the sort of uh, emulator writers who are constantly under the threat of being sued. Somehow they have also survived the fire of litigation. Um, so this is an amazing kind of story of the success, successful preservation. Uh, we only worry, have to worry about, you know, like uh, flash drives and, uh, and, uh, and, and old floppy disks. They had an entire continent armed with muskets and smallpox bent on their genocide. And somehow their culture still survived. So if we take the salamander as the sort of um, metaphor for our, our, our mode of preservation, um, there's one more attribute it has which I think is very helpful for us to think about. And that is salamanders have a long tail. Now the long tail in the context of digital media means something rather specific. It is a, a phrase originally um, coined and popularized by Chris Anderson of Wired Magazine. Uh, about the way that the internet allows you to find people who are experts just by digging into forums, uh, online searches, and, and so forth. So, you know, here's kind of a, a, an example from coffee, you know, like everybody likes coffee and some people are just happy with, ah, I'll just take any coffee, right? So if you were like, well, I, 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 I have to uh, uh, have a coffee shop that's, you know, um, somewhere where only a few people go, I, I mean, make sure to offer just the kinds of coffee that most people like. But then there are some people who are like, no, I, I only make coffee myself from coffee beans. And then some people, oh, it has to be medium roast. Oh, it has to be vacuum packed. Oh, it has to be medium roast, vacuum packed. Blah, blah. You know, so they can get very specific. These sort of aficionados of coffee, they're really intense. Well, if you have a, a, a coffee shop, you know, just in a square in Karlsruhe, you might have to offer just main coffee. But if you're on the internet, you can get some really specific, like, oh, I only offer, you know, Colombian coffee beans that are vacuum wrapped from this certain place and da, 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 and people will flock to you and find you. 
Because on the internet, there's always someone out there, and we say in the long tail of this curve, that has a specialty that is the same as yours. They have a specialty that you need. Um, and that's a reason why things like Amazon can have more books than a regular bookstore. Um, eBay and, and, and these other models offer a, an incredible range of products that's beyond what a particular store could offer. There's always someone in the long tail who can help. And we can use this for preservation. How? Well, here's an example. We can enlist technicians from the long tail. This is a, 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 a satellite, a spacecraft called the ISEE-3. Um, it was a comet explorer, and it was sent off to, to look at a comet in 1978 by NASA and the European Space Agency. It came back. You know, it takes a while for these things, right? Comes back to the sun, comes back to Earth. But it didn't get a hero's welcome. There's no one in it, for one thing. But also, NASA couldn't talk to it anymore. They're like, you know, the software on that thing is from 1978. We have no clue how to get back in touch with it. Our contemporary protocols are different. Uh, everything's obsolete. Our radar, you know, all, all the ways we have of communicating aren't working anymore. So we're just going to let it like fly by. It's a useless piece of space junk now, even though it was this heroic experiment at the time. So a cartoonist named Randall Monroe, whose popular column XKCD is read, read by a lot of people, put out a call and said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if some people out there on the internet, some citizen scientists, could figure this out? Because there's a lot of people out there in that long tail, and some of them are really keen on comets and space and so on. So this informal team of people got together, and last May, I think it was, I received one of the most amazing tweets I have ever seen. We are now in command of the ISEE-3 spacecraft. Some nerds, space geeks, uh, whatever you want to call them, they got together and they said, we can figure this out. And they reached across miles of, millions of miles of empty space. They crowdsourced, uh, crowdfunded, I should say. They got, they got people to fund them time on dish antennas around the world, which is not easy to come by and expensive. And they reanimated this 36-year-old software protocol and fired the thrusters on the damn spacecraft. I mean, this was incredible, right? What NASA couldn't do, a bunch of amateurs did. <coughs> so if you can do that, saving some you know, uh, a media art on a hard drive maybe isn't so bad. What else can we do with amateurs? Well, we can enlist them to interpret things. This is the Variable Media Questionnaire. It is a device that I and others have created to document um, interpretations of how uh, artworks, in particular, should survive in, through time. How will they be preserved? Will, when storage is no longer an option, should they just die? Or are there other ways, like emulation, that we can keep them going? We originally just asked the artist. Who knows better than the artist? But then over time, people said, you know, John, I think there's a lot of other people who have opinions about this. So we started to open, oh, maybe also the conservators or, or the technicians who worked with the artist. Well, now in the latest one, we said, anybody, you know, did you go see the exhibition in 1965 in Howard Wise Gallery in New York? Then what do you think? Because I didn't, right? And so there might be people out there in the long tail who have opinions that are very important and that represent part of the public memory of the work. Another example, uh, we can enlist artists to help. <coughs> so here is a computer magazine. It was called Computer Graphics and Art ran in the mid-70s, um, and um, it had these crazy artworks that were made in computers that no longer work. No one can even find them anymore. Many of the artists are dead. Um, but there's these remarkable images that were created algorithmically. So a bunch of um, folks uh, who are contemporary artists said, well, that's kind of cool. You know, I wish we had access to the source code, because then we could emulate them. But we don't. But that's OK, because maybe we can just remake them. And so they. They put out this call on the internet to remake works of digital art from the earliest period, the 70s, uh, in, this, in this magazine. And so literally, they worked from a PDF of the magazine. They put it online. And anyone could try to recreate it. And when they did, they'd post it on this website. And people would say, oh, this is a good version. That's not a good version. This is Manfred Moa from, uh, from 1973, I think, something like that. They recreated in processing, which is a contemporary technology. So they didn't even have access to the original code. All they saw was the picture, and they said, I think I can recode that. So artists can remake things. Again, no institution, no museum set this up. They're not part of a collection. They just said, this is cool. I'd like to do this. And they went and did it on their own for free. That's the benefit of working with amateurs. 
Um, this is not even crowdsourcing because there is no museum that said, we would like your help with this. This is amateurs just doing it voluntarily. Okay, I'll just do one example in a little bit of detail, 3D scanning. So we have these precious artifacts in museums. Um, some of them are you know, too valuable to exhibit, like the gold mask of Agamemnon. Some of them are too vulnerable to exhibit, like Matthew Barney had made these dumbbells out of Vaseline and they sort of, you know. Um, what do you do with those? Well, um, there's a new technology, it's not that new, but uh, it's recently become available to consumers um, in which you can take even just something as simple as a cell phone and scan, take a bunch of pictures of an image and uh, immediately upload it and turn it into a 3D scan. And sometimes it works well and sometimes not so well, but it works uh, well enough that museums like the San Francisco Museum of Asian Art have used it to allow visitors to take pictures and create skins of the objects in their collection. And let me see, I think I have one. Yes, yeah, so this is a scan from, uh, da, 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 da. this is a, a scan from a, um, a piece that I took in Mexico. Let's see if the internet is working. There we go. So I went with uh, Dragon actually to this uh, amazing museum of Aztec uh, uh, sculpture and, um, and um, uh, uh, temple in Mexico City. And um, I wanted to try out the scan, so I took this picture, just maybe 30 pictures, 40 pictures of this, um, of this puma that was created by the Aztecs. And uh, just kind of move over here. You see that it's got pretty good detail. Um, I don't know if you can tell um, in this format, but uh, it, it's, it's, it took me you know, maybe five minutes to do, and now I have this 3D scan of this object. And again, nothing more than an iPhone, and it works with lots of different, you can even just take pictures and use a website to do it. So this is me as an amateur, uh, just going ahead and creating this digital product. And if I want, I can even push a button and have it printed and sent to me. Or if I have my own 3D printer, um, they can send it to, you know, I can print it myself. Uh, so, uh, 3D scanning has become something that is no longer a, 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 you know, something that has to take place in, in, in the research lab. It's something that can be in your pocket. Uh, here's another example of something that is involving 3D scanning, but in a very different way. Uh, a guy named um, uh, Blaise uh, Aguirre Yarcas, a uh, Spanish architect, uh, discovered um, a, a way to use the crowd, that is, the, the amateurs who in this case have taken photographs themselves using the online site Flickr. And in Flickr, you can look up things with tags. He had a 3D model of Notre Dame, and he applied the photographs that were tagged via Flickr to create a remarkable 3D artifact, which I'll show you here. This is from a TED talk that he did. It's called Photosynth. I'd like to jump straight to, um, to one of Noah's original data sets. And this is from an early prototype of Photosynth that we first got working in the summer. Uh, to show you what I think is really the, the punchline behind uh, this, this technology, the photosynth technology. And it's not necessarily so apparent from looking at the environments that they put up on the website. We, um, we had to worry about the lawyers and so on. This is a reconstruction of Notre Dame Cathedral that was done entirely computationally from images scraped from Flickr. You just type Notre Dame into Flickr, and uh, you get some pictures of guys in t-shirts and of the campus and so on. And uh, each of these orange cones represents an image that was, uh, that was discovered to belong to this model. Um, and so these are, all, these are all Flickr images, and they've all been related um, spatially in this way. We can just navigate in this very simple way. Pause it there. Uh, so, 
you, what, what you're seeing, is, I'm, I apologize for the screen uh, not being that legible, it's a 3D model onto which all of these photographs from Flickr have been identified and placed so that you can zoom in at any level of detail. So here you have this remarkable, important cultural artifact, Notre Dame Cathedral, that is basically reconstructed at almost any level of detail using just photographs that weren't even taken for preservation, but that were just out there, taken by the crowd, with crappy cameras, good cameras, cell phone cameras, and even, in this case, a poster. So that's an example of, uh, of, of how um, we can use um, the crowd, the amateurs, to help us do the hard work of digital preservation. But there's some problems, right? So the most common problem lobbied at this use of amateurs is that we will lose integrity. Uh, the artwork won't have its original spirit. Uh, you're going to let all these people make versions of it? What happens when they go in the wrong direction? Um, examples. Okay, so uh, uh, um, one of the, the moral rights laws in Europe were prompted in part by this case of a Picasso print called Trois Femmes in which uh, a, the collectors threatened to cut it into one inch squares and sell off each of them individually. Right? So, you know, what about the integrity of the original piece? You're destroying it by letting people do whatever they want with it instead of having it in a museum. Another problem, um, colorizing old movies. That's Marilyn Monroe. No, that's not Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe was black and white in Asphalt Jungle. She didn't look colorized in this hideous kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, funeral home parlor version. Um, so I can't stand that, you know, Ted Turner is going and colorizing old movies. Uh, what about... Um, Star Wars, okay, you know, how many people heard of Han shot first, that particular, uh, yeah, okay, so there was a, there was a big uh, uh, scandal on the internet when um, George Lucas went and, re and changed some of the scenes of Star Wars when he put out his DVD versions, and in particular, he added an explosion to make it seem like uh, a villain who uh, Han Solo was talking with shot first, whereas in fact, in the original movie, it was Han who shot, and this, of course, ruined the fact that Han was this character to be redeemed. So these are examples where I think it's terrible that we let people change the work, that that kind of attempt to make it more like a phoenix or a salamander actually did harm. But I think there's a little bit of a difference here. There's a difference between the analog and the digital. And the difference is in analog, you have either or. Okay, so you have the Parthenon, right? And of course, Lord Elgin takes out the beautiful marbles and puts them in a museum in the British Museum in London. Well, when he does that, he leaves a gaping hole in the Parthenon, right? You can't have them in the British Museum and also have them back where they belonged in the Parthenon. That's not true for digital media. In digital media, you don't have either or, you have both and. So you can have the original and you can have the new version that sort of occupies the same space or, or, or an adjacent space, what we might call a, a digital palimpsest. So this, for example, is a, a little chart of, um, of Linux distributions and how they have forked and changed over time. And um, they, you know, this is a, a very well-known operating system uh, used by lots of people and lots of web servers, and yet it has proliferated into many different variations, not without problems, right? It's hard to keep track of them all. But the fact that this one exists, that you know, Debian exists, doesn't stop uh, Ubuntu from existing or, or Red Hat, they're all different variations and they all work simultaneously without one impeding the other. Um, okay, yeah, but what about the awful things that people will do to culture, right? So here's from this um, scanathon that I mentioned at the Asia uh, Museum in, in San Francisco. Of course, some people scan these uh, you know, important uh, artifacts of Indian culture, or Asian culture, and then they made these kind of, you know, oh, I made a vase with the little flowers in it out of this you know, famous important deity, this Indian deity. And we say, wow, that's kitsch. You know, we're just gonna let the amateurs make a mess of, of culture by making this lowly kind of kitsch stuff. So uh, I had this slide particularly for Dragon. Uh, it made me think a little bit of what museums do, in particular this kind of Kandinsky-inspired scarf. <laughs> oh, right, I forgot, we do that too. Just go to the gift shop of any museum and you will find mugs and scarves and t-shirts and, and, and an abomination to the art that we see on display. But on the other hand, you know, for some people that is the way they access art. So I don't think we can criticize the amateur preservationists if we don't also criticize the museums uh, that are supposedly the professionals. Uh, another great example, I think, of uh, both and, and I'll stop on this uh, for uh, this slide, is um, in, uh, in the, uh, the, the natives in, um, in the Yukon have uh, 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 an orca hat. It is a, a killer whale, as we say, hat that is important 
um, in, the, in the rites of, of passage. Uh, and uh, there was a, um, a, 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 a chief who needed to use this hat to pass on, he was, his health was failing, he needed to pass on the, the duties of, of, of rule to his son. Um, but um, the, the, the hat had been collected by the Smithsonian in Washington. And it takes a long time to repatriate these things, a lot of bureaucracy and so forth. So they figured out, you know, what if we make a 3D scan and we get it painted and milled and look like the original, okay? So this is the, origi this is the original, this is the 3D scan, so it looks very similar, and you use that. And the, the, the Tinglet said, fine, we'll use that. And so this is actually a picture of the, of the, the ruler wearing the, the, um, the, the 3D version, the scanned version of the hat along with some of the original hats. In the end, there was even a case where um, one, of the, one of the tribes said, you know, we don't really care about the original. You can keep that in a museum. Just keep sending us a 3D scan of it. Because for us, it's the behavior of the hat that matters, not the atoms that the hat was originally made from. And so here we have an example where the sort of two threads I draw at the beginning of sort of you know, emulating something digitally and then this sort of native re-performance and, and retelling come together in a nice way at the Smithsonian. Um, finally, I just mentioned that uh, there, the 3D is uh, something that's going on here in Khosra. Um, this is someone who I, I won't name because I don't want to embarrass, uh, Morgan Strico, who's here in the audience. Um, she is working with uh, ZKM as a media conservator and has recently been creating 3D models of some of the works so that we can recreate them when the original technology dies. Here we have the work of uh, Jesus Munoz uh, Morcillo and his colleagues, uh, Florian and Antonio, um, at, um, at um, the um, uh, ISAS lab. Did I get that right? Okay. In, in, uh, at uh, part of uh, Kiete, and uh, they are looking at a, a Namju Peak sculpture, which is vulnerable because it has neon-like tubes and, and cathode ray tubes and these, these things that we know are gonna die, and they're looking at recreating a 3D version of it in virtual reality, that you can walk around and see what it looked like. Not as a substitute for the original, because we don't all wanna become, you know, walking around with Google Glass all day, looking at art, but as a complement so that if it does die, we know how to recreate it in the future. And again, to try to bring these back together, we have people in the, in the professional world starting to work with scanning and other techniques like this, but guess what? They're also using open source software like Blender and the Unreal Engine, which come from gaming, okay? So again, we see finally the people in the, in the, in the, the lofty institutions of of, of preservation, starting to work with the salamanders, the sort of lowly creatures uh, and practices of proliferative amateur preservation. And I'm really happy to see that happen, especially here in Karlsruhe. So I'll just end with a quote from Jean Cocteau, the poet, who was asked, he had a fabulous uh, art collection, and he was asked, what was the one thing from this you know, wonderful collection you have? If, if it caught fire, your house caught fire, what is the one thing that you would preserve? And in the true spirit of artists, he replied, the fire. Thank you very much. <laughs>